Hello, welcome to the latest episode of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, where we celebrate the works of the greatest storyteller of the 20th century. My name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books about uh, pulp fiction and old time radio and other pre, uh, forms of pre digital pop culture. And I'm here tonight with my two co hosts. And one of those co hosts is yours truly, Jess Carroll. You all might know me from the Facebook discussion group for love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs. We are 6,000 strong Burroughs fans, and we talk at ERB more or less uh, 24 hours a day. Love to have you come join us on Facebook for love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I'm Scott Stewart, a uh, happy member of this trio here, <laughs> and looking forward to seeing what we come up with the uh, conclusion of this uh, book here. Yes, and we are planning on finishing Beasts of Tarzan tonight. We did not originally plan uh, for it to be a, a three-parter, but um, uh, a combination of having a surprising amount to talk about and some technical difficulties when we were recording part one has stretched it out into three parts. And we are going to be jumping right in in a moment with uh, chapter 13. So if, you, uh, if it's been a while since you've read the novel or if you haven't listened to our last two episodes, I would recommend that you pause here and get caught up because we are just gonna dive right into the story where it's at and, uh, and go from there. Um, so, uh, but before that. <laughs> I, I hear the apes of Kershak in the distance reminding us that it's time for our My First ERB segment. And this week, we're gonna talk about yet another poll that was run on Jess's For the Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs, where I asked people to let us know the very first Edgar Rice Burroughs book they read. And I structured the poll so that they could add a title to it if it wasn't already there. Um, we ended up with like 22 different titles on here. Um, but most of them, of the um, slightly less than 200 respondents, 103 of them, uh, which would include myself, picked uh, Tarzan of the Apes as their very first Burroughs book. Um, second place was A Princess of Mars with 58. Um, then it goes way down to nine people did Return of Tarzan, which I believe would include uh, both you guys, right, Justin Scott? Yeah. yeah. There it is. Um, Land the Time Forgot was seven votes. Uh, At the Earth's Core was six. And then just a wide variety of stuff, mostly either uh, Tarzan or Mars books, uh, got anywhere from uh, six votes down to one vote. Uh, there are a few one shots in there, like somebody read uh, The Lost Continent first. There were a few people who read the first Venus book first. Um, uh, the Outlaw of Torn, and somebody in the comments mentioned that that, when he, that was his first book and he's, quote, changed my life, unquote. Um, uh, the Monster Man was another first uh, was another entry, as was Beyond Thirty, now known as the Lost Continent. Um, so there's no shortage of of, uh, of books, although most of them, not surprisingly, I think, since that's uh, where was Tarzan of the Apes, because that is the character that is best known amongst uh, just in popular culture in general. Um, we did have some great comments. Several people commented on starting with uh, in the middle of the Mars series and just loving it to death, but having a little bit of trouble figuring out what was going on until they just uh, finally felt themselves drawn into that world. So we might take that as a warning for new readers to start from the beginning in any one series, but uh, clearly it doesn't always matter. Um, um, there were three votes, for instance, for Tarzan and the Lost Emperor, Empire which is where he encounters a lost Roman, Roman colony in, in Africa. I think that would be a great starting point. You just, you got to know who Tarzan is, but everybody does. And from there, it's just a, a slam bang adventure with a, with a solid beginning and solid ending. And it doesn't depend on you knowing, uh, the, knowing Tarzan's background in the books beyond he's Tarzan. Um, you, have, you know, any thoughts from you guys about this, Paul? Well, if I may jump in, I, it, it's, it's hard to articulate this. I really can't articulate this in, in mathematical or scientific terms, but it's just a gut feeling. It's a personal belief. I have no evidence to support it. 
But my gut feeling is, and, and, and every situation is going to be unique. My gut feeling is that Burroughs comes to us, and by Burroughs, I mean his books, be it Tarzan, mm -hmm. uh, the Barsoom series, or, 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 or whatever. Uh, that Burroughs comes to us when we need him the most. Um, and it's a very memorable it's a very memorable event that impacts us when we perhaps need guidance, when we need reassurance, when we need comfort, when we need escapism. Uh, certainly, I, I would say that was definitely in my case. Burroughs came to me when I needed him most. Mm -hmm. and, and I would speculate that that's true of other people, but it's a tough thing to gauge or to measure or to verify. It's just a gut feeling. Go ahead. I think I think that's true. Um, I think Burroughs means a lot to people for exactly those reasons, that we can just immerse ourselves in a well-told story with themes of heroism and honor and honesty. Um, the, uh, when we need to just get away from the real world for a little while. Um, and uh, escapism is an important thing. And I think Burroughs, the themes and the depth of his stories are uh, you know, it's just saying they're just escapism doesn't say everything about him. But obviously, escapism is a vital part of why we enjoy him. And I agree with what you said. You know, he comes to us when we need him. And um, it, spending time with characters we like and admire in a, in a world where for the time we're visiting there, we kind of believe it's real. Uh, that's important. Um, that's why that's one of the, the main values of fiction and of storytelling in our world. Oh, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, it is interesting. Just a few other interesting comments. I, a few people started with uh, Tarzan at the Earth's core, and there were a couple votes for Back to the Stone Age, which immediately follows that one. But that would be kind of an interesting experience. I think Burroughs brings you up to speed with what was going on, but in each case, you would feel like you were coming in partway through a story. Um, uh, but um, and I guess it's his skill as a storyteller that the people who read that did not get frustrated with the fact that they're starting in the middle of a series, even if it takes them a little bit to figure out completely what's going on. They they're still drawn into it. Um, so it's another tribute to Burroughs as a great storyteller. Um, even if you're coming into the series late, it's still going to get you, and you'll still end up a fan. I think it also can coincide to title too, like. Uh, for me, Return of Tarzan, it mm -hmm. was the uh, Whitman hardback, 69 cents in Woolworths uh, when I was in third grade, which was um, a little while ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, here, 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 here's this uh, um, uh, kind of a shaded blue cover, if you know the cover there, with Tarzan in a um, desert Arab style wardrobe with the knife out, fighting a uh, attacking lion and protecting the uh, uh, female behind him on it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're eight, nine, ten, you know, I think I was nine at the time, it's really hard to pass up a book with that cover. Now, yeah. I, I already knew who Tarzan was because of um, uh, after school matinees that ran a lot of uh, Weissmuller. Uh, uh, Tarzan movies and um, uh, the little town theater that in the town I grew up in uh, was not uncommon for them. Uh, they didn't always have a matinee every Saturday, but it wasn't uncommon for matinees to, to be shown. And uh, um, that's where I saw Valley of the Gold when it was released with Mike Henry and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tarzan Three Challenges, you know, uh, with uh, um, um, Oh, is that Jack Mahoney? I can't remember who that yeah, was. Yeah, Jack Mahoney. Thank you. Okay. you know, and so so you see those, and and I knew the lore of Tarzan. I think, you know, the world's changed a lot, but I think a kid in the United States in the 50s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. yeah, it was just part of the culture. You knew yeah. about being raised from apes. So when I came in to return to Tarzan as my first book, I knew the general background of it, and mm -hmm. that didn't. Uh, that didn't hurt with the story and and return of tarzan stands very well by itself in in the characters and um when he does some briefings or recalls or flashbacks on stuff that it's very self-contained i didn't feel like i was missing anything 
only thing I knew is when I got done with it is I got, I enjoy it a whole lot more than most of the Tarzan movies, which I loved and never tried to miss, but mm -hmm. it, it brought that whole different uh, new, uh, as we talked about, uh, an intelligent Tarzan, uh, uh, one uh, conversant in several languages. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it, it was, uh, I thought it was amazing. And back when we had talked about Valley of Gold movie too, that was so, so seemed so different to have Mike Henry as Tarzan in the car and in the bull arena and fighting and doing the James Bond type thing. But it fit because, you know, Tarzan does have a certain code he lives with, but as just mentioned the comic book cover uh, last week with machine gun, he's, he's not a dummy. He, if he's yeah. got a tool to take advantage of the evil people, he's going to use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's just a great character. So I, and, uh, um, I think that's just, uh, yeah, um, I don't have anything to add to it. I think that's, that's just great. Um, and you mentioned you read it in the Whitman hardcover. Sorry, I just got to go off on a tangent. Um, growing up in the 60s, those Whitman hardcovers, whether they were reprints of classics like Tarzan or whether they were TV tie-in novels, like I had one based on the Rat Patrol when I was a little kid that I yeah. loved that I found and reread as an adult and still thought it was a great. Those Whitmans, that they, they did not write down to kids. They respected their audience, even though they were being marketed to children. And mm -hmm. they gave us some great storytelling. Um, anybody yeah. ever sees a Whitman hardcover in a used bookstore, whether it's Tarzan or a TV, or based on a TV show or uh, mm -hmm. what have you, snatch it up and buy it. You'll love reading it. Absolutely. You know, um, and I, I, like many other people, have certain runs we try to collect. Mm -hmm. I like the science fiction stuff, Star Trek, Space Eagle, Voyage to Obama Sea. They did great jobs at adapting them. And mm -hmm. though Return of Tarzan, uh, Whitman, it was abridged. It wasn't abridged that much. It, it brought the story through very, uh, very much to heart of what Burroughs uh, wrote. And, um, and it was not dry at all. So it was a perfect introduction for me at that because when I was nine, third grade, uh, uh, it was the first time I read a Tarzan book and it was the first time I read a Zorro book, which was also a Whitman book. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I read them like in a day and then read them again because it was- <laughs> Well, they're uh, easy reading. I actually yeah. found, I found their Hawaii Five O Whitman hardcover from 1969 and read it this weekend in just a couple of hours. And I loved okay. it. It was, it was a well-told detective story. So um, uh, just Whitman was just a great publisher if you were a kid in the 60s. So, um, okay, but we probably need to get back on track or we'll end up having to do a part four and just become the beast of Tarzan podcast and never move on to another <laughs> book. So, <laughs> so Jess, you were gonna pick up and remember, I warned everyone earlier, we are, start, we are just diving into the story right where we left off. So please go listen to parts one and two before you finish this episode. Go come back to this episode. And Jess, you were going to pick up with chapter 13. And Tim, what is that website for our various episodes? And I, uh, it is erbpodcast.blogspot.com. Thank you so much. You remember that so much better than I, although mm -hmm. I do visit it regularly. Mm -hmm. And I encourage everyone else to take a listen to our prior, prior broadcast. Okay, um, I'm supposed to go ahead. I was going to say whatever podcast service, because it, it shares out to a lot of podcast platforms. So if you're listening to this on Anchor or Apple or Podbean, or you're asking Alexa to play the latest episode, you can go back and find the others there as well. And, and if, there's, if there's one thing I would say about this book, and I can say a great deal, it mm -hmm. is a roller coaster ride. It is rapid fire. There's a lot going on in, in just a, in a short number of pages. Uh, it's very exciting, and uh, I will, as Tim said, I'm going to spare you a detailed recap in the interest of time, but I'm going to run through the roster here of the, um, uh, shall we say, the primary, some of the primary players. Um, the gist of the story, or the basis for the story, is that the child, the infant child, Jack, that's Tarzan and James, John Clayton, that is, when I say Tarzan and John Clayton, that's the same person, uh, their infant child, Jack, has been kidnapped. Uh, uh, 
in in pursuit of that kidnapping or trying to get it resolved, Tarzan himself, John Clayton, was also abducted. And Jane came right behind him and she was abducted. In fact, they were both on the same boat, although he, Tarzan, did not know Jane was on there until much, much later. She knew he was he was on there, but she couldn't get to him. They were both in separate rooms and held apart from each other. The uh, primary villain is Rokoff, R-O-K-O-F-F. And if I say Rokoff, please forgive me. Uh, that's the way I pronounced the name when I was quite young. I first read this in old habits, sometimes a hard hard to bypass, but Rokoff is our primary villain. Um, a hero that you will heard mention of is the Swede. He's the guy who goes around saying, going to blow pretty soon, pretty hard, but he's a good natured fellow. I'll just tell you that right here. All right. So the dilemma here is that the infant child, Jack, has been kidnapped. Um, Tarzan and Jane are both see here jane i know for sure is on the on the boat which is named the whatever the boat is named the kincaid kincaid thank you so very much and we enter our story chapter 13 entitled escape where rockoff there i go rockoff is speaking to jane about his plans for her and he tells her <clears throat> that their child as she and tarzan's child will be raised by cannibals of the wagam wasm tribe now that's very upsetting the thing that Rokoff does not realize, there's two things in fact, that the baby, the infant that he has does not belong to Tarzan and Jane, it's someone else's, but he doesn't know that. Their child was, there was a kidnapping attempt on their child. That's, that is very true. But Rokoff does not have the child. Um, they also, furthermore, the infant child that he does have recently passed away as explained in the story. And that's tragic, of course. Uh, but Rokoff does not know that. He thinks the child is still alive. And Jane is being quiet. If she knows, and she knows it's not her child, she knows she knows that it passed away. But uh, she's being very silent about this because she's making an effort to protect her child wherever he might be. She does not want Rokoff to know that the infant child is not hers. And in fact, and here's an excerpt from chapter 13. Now, this is Jane speaking. No, the Russian must never know that this was not her baby. She realized her position was hopeless with Anderson, that's that Swede I mentioned, and her husband dead, husband being Tarzan, there was no one in all the world to desire to save her who would know where she might be found. End of that excerpt. So Jane is hopeless and in despair. Rokoff threatens rape of her, uh, and then he says he would give Jane to the cannibal chief as a wife, another insult uh, intended for Tarzan. Uh, Jane demand, Jane reveals the child is dead, demands a burial, and Rokoff complies. Jane later follows Rokoff to his camp. So disheartened, believing McGowan's, McGowan Wazam's report of Tarzan's death, Jane contemplates suicide. Now, another book excerpt, this is also from chapter 13. Rokoff did not hesitate to use rough methods when he found out that he was to have difficulty in carrying out his intentions. Repeatedly, he struck Jane Clayton in the face until at last, half conscious, she was dragged within his tent. End of that excerpt. So, as stated there, Rokoff beats Jane nearly unconscious, dragging her into his tent. A uh, key word there is nearly. She's still alive, but she's hurting for certain. Um, and now another excerpt where Jane still has some wits and she is looking for an opportunity. Uh, the hero, be it Tarzan or whomever, does not miss that opportunity to, to get out of a jam. And that opportunity came just as Rokoff was lifting her upon the cot. Now, this is a book excerpt, chapter 13. A noise at the tent door behind him brought his head quickly about and away from the girl, the girl being Jane. The butt of the gun was not an inch from her hand. And with a single lightning-like move, she snatched the weapon from his holster. At the same instant, Rokoff turned back towards her, realizing his peril. She did not fire for fear the shot would bring his people about. And without a sound, she, she clobbers him, though. She hits him with the gun. And without a sound, he sank limp and unconscious to the ground. A moment later, the girl, Jane, stood beside him for a moment, at least free from the menace of his lust. End of that excerpt. So taking Rokoff's knife, she eggs at the back, back of the tent, cuts a hole in the tent, crawls out of that, and escapes into the jungle. End of chapter 13. 
Uh, so to summarize, chapter 13 has been tough, but Jane has finally escaped Rockoff, leaving him beaten but alive. Comments, thoughts, questions? First, I'd like to mention, because I forgot to earlier, that we are making use of the uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs chapter summary project found at erblist.com. Um, we, we always read the book, of course, and make no, our own notes before uh, the podcast, but um, the chapter summary is awful useful when we're summarizing it on the podcast, and we just want to thank the scholars who did all that work for us, and we do make use to it. Some, often when we are doing a chapter summary, we're paraphrasing sentences from the work they did. And I just want to give them full credit and refer other people to erblist.com for these just perfectly done chapter summaries. Uh, um, a young fellow by the name of Tangor runs that website, erblist.com. Tell Tangor we said, hey. Okay. And uh, what I want to comment about this chapter is just how awesome and how proactive Jane is. She has no reason not to be in despair. She has some hope that the baby that was uh, brought to Africa was not hers, but she doesn't know where Jack is. You know, you know, what happened to him after he was kidnapped in London? She has no idea. She thinks Tarzan is dead and she thinks she's doomed. But despite this, she keeps her wits about her to make sure Rokoff doesn't find out that the dead baby's not hers. Um, is the only thing she can do to keep Jack safe wherever Jack is. And even though she's beaten, she keeps her wits about her enough to take the opportunity to grab his gun, Rokoff's gun to know not to shoot so it won't bring his henchmen in and to knock him unconscious, get his knife to cut the, uh, the tent out and get away. She doesn't stop thinking. She acts proactively and intelligently even when she's in emotional despair and in deadly danger. Um, and uh, you know, uh, this is typical of Burroughs' female heroes. They often need to be rescued. They often are damsels in distress, but they are never helpless and they're never dumb and they're always wonderful in their own right. And this is one of Jane's more awesome moments in the in the Tarzan series, I think. Any further comments? No? Yes, that's from over here. <laughs> okay, very well. Well, then I shall press on with chapter 14. Now, something perhaps I did not clarify, Tarzan was abducted by Rokoff early on in this adventure, but he was, he was turned loose on what turned out to be an island um, and uh, well, Rokoff thought he was he Tarzan would be stuck, uh, but being Tarzan, he of course has commandeered, he has improvised and commandeered away off that island. In fact, he Tarzan is in pursuit of Rokoff. Along the way, Tarzan has gathered followers, and these are the Beast of Tarzan, hence, hence the name of this book. And we've got a number of Mangani, the number varies, but there's there could be a uh, we may get a count here, a head count here later on, but there could be between 10 and, and 12. There were, yeah, the, there were 10, but a few were killed in the village fight a few chapters back. So I think there's like seven or eight at the moment. I can't remember the number either. But the key player on the Mangani side of this team is Akut, who is showing a great deal of intelligence. And uh, he is the leader of these Mangani, of this Mangani tribe. And in fact, uh, he is teaching that he and Bugambi uh, is teaching uh, all these Mangani to row the boat, literally. Uh, now, I mentioned Mugambi. He was the survivor of a band of uh, uh, natives that uh, Tarzan had a run-in with. Uh, the natives did not fare too well, but Mugambi survived that battle and uh, agreed to join Tarzan's team here. And then the um, other um, force, I would call it an engine of destruction, and that would be Sheeta the Leopard is also on board. Yes, a leopard. I ain't a kid. I mean a cat. A big cat. <laughs> and he's riding around this boat with all these people, and they're all staying on one side of the boat. He's up there in the front with Tarzan, where Tarzan keeps an eye on him. But he is very much a leopard. He very much uh, can, can take care of himself and, and anyone he encounters. So this is the Beast of Tarzan. It is an unlikely team, and it has been very successful and effective thus far. So as chapter 14, Alone in the Jungle, opens up, one of the things that uh, Rokoff immediately finds out is that Tarzan is coming with his apes and his panther. Um, and furthermore, Rokoff has also found out that Jane has escaped. And his camp is just really confused with the, with the absent, with the escape by Jane and the news that Tarzan is coming. I would say panic is setting in. The natives run off in terror, leaving Rokoff and seven of his sailors deserted 
and robbed of nearly every article of value. Rockoff berates his men, those seven sailors who are still there, so they shoot at him. It's just a bad day for Rockoff. <laughs> now, Rockoff sees Tarzan coming and runs into the jungle. His men run also, but they're heading in the opposite direction. Tarzan lets the men go to their deaths in the jungle because the jungle just isn't very forgiving for anyone who's not prepared to be in the jungle. Tarzan wants Rockoff, that's where he's heading. Rockoff scurried like a hunted rabbit. That's a direct quote from Burroughs. I would say Tarzan is a relentless hound in search of Rockoff. Now, Tambutsa suggests that Rockoff has probably returned to Magamazam's, forgive me, Magamazam's tribe or village, that is. He agrees and sets out briskly, leaving an old woman to follow. Oh, the old woman would be Tambudza. That's correct. She's, a, she's an advisor who's guiding Tarzan to this, uh, to this camp. Now, Tarzan thinks that Jane is with Rockoff. Uh, however, she's not. She managed to escape, as we found out in the previous chapter. So Tarzan arrives at the village, this would be the uh, Maganwazan's village, where he finds he is mistaken. Jane's not there. And Rockoff's not there. So he returns to Rockoff's camp to pick up the real spore, the trail, which his nose quickly discovers. Uh, and this is an example of Tarzan making a rare assumption. Usually he, he listens to his nose, so to speak, and, and checks for the other signs uh, in tracking uh, before making a decision, but he was in a hurry, I would imagine. Now, Jane, shifting gears here, Jane still has Rockoff's pistol. And she also discovers Anderson's big game rifle and ammunition when she stumbles upon the spot where he, Anderson, that's that Swede I was telling you about, had hidden her. So she's, she's got, some, got a rifle now and some ammunition. So she's armed. She, now, Jane sees Mugambi and the band of apes and Cheetah. That's the beast of Tarzan we were discussing. Jane does not know they're with Tarzan. I mean... You, you see, you see a person, you see an ape, you see a tribe of apes, Magani, and you see a, a leopard all hanging around together. You really ought to figure out that Tarzan's involved in this. But Jane, being cautious, and she has had an experience, she decides to hide and go the opposite direction because she's being very protective, and that's understandable. Uh, she does not know that's Tarzan's entourage of beasts, so Jane eludes them. Jane takes off, not realizing these animals are coming to rescue her. So Rockoff comes up behind Jane, sees the same amazing sight, that is the beast of Tarzan, but he knows they are Tarzan's allies. Rockoff stays out of their way too, but, but uh, doesn't communicate with Jane at that point. Jane makes her way to the river and launches a canoe just as she finds a canoe there. People leave their canoes laying about in Africa. We've had that happen before. So she finds a canoe and commandeers it. Just as Rockoff runs up to the shore, stricken with horror, Jane notices a trailing rope that Rockoff reaches for just as she pulls away into the river. So just when you think you're safe, here comes that villain Rockoff again. Now that's the end of chapter 14. So Jane's free, but Rockoff's on her trail. Tarzan and the Beast are getting close, and they have been closer but they haven't all connected just yet. Any thoughts or comments, chapter 14? Well, I think it's interesting to note that Burroughs often used the same character's point of view throughout a chapter, but in this case, he switches several times. We have events from Rokoff's point of view, events from Tarzan's point of view, events from Jane's point of view, back to Rokoff, and so on and so forth. I believe he does that to keep the pacing of the cha of chapter rapid fire, to keep the not just to give us the information we need to follow the story, but also to keep things fast moving and exciting. It's just like one thing after another. And those, cha those rapid changes in point of view, I think are a part of that. And it's a, yet a tribute, another tribute to how clear, how good a storyteller he was that he does all these point of view changes within a sh relatively short chapter, but we never lose track of what's going on. We always understand uh, whose point of view we're, we're being, uh, we're seeing and what the and we're always able to follow the action. It's a wonderfully done example of storytelling. Very well said. And, and you know, that, I think that I've read this book several times. It's certainly a favorite of mine. And that this point about point of view, um, it always occurs to me because it's, it's very smooth. It's, it, it's, you can tell that the point of view has shifted. That much is clear. But it just mm -hmm. seems to go flow very naturally with the story. 
Mm-hmm. And it's always interesting to get other people's perspective. I mean, they're on the spot reporters, so to speak. I think the only person, a person in quotation marks, that you don't get a point of view from is the leopard. And the story's not over yet. He may have something to say before <laughs> all this is over with. Um, <clears throat> all right, no further comments. Um, actually, there's one other thing I think is interesting. This only just occurred to me, but uh, Burroughs, uh, the way Rockoff's own men shot at him, and part of that is because he's been treating them like garbage the whole time, um, that parallels exactly how loyal Mugambi and the uh, beasts of Tarzan are to Tarzan, because they know he's going to treat them right and will be loyal to them and will risk his own life to help them if need be. So you have Rokoff, who's a coward and a villain, whose men end up turning away from him. And then you have Tarzan, who is a good and loyal leader, whose men, whose men or animals, as the case may be, will follow him into the mouth of hell. Um, there's a direct parallel there. I never noticed that before, but it is definitely there. That's an excellent point, and it echoes, and we've discussed this um, probably as recently as last week, and that is Burroughs, the, the, the heroes of Burroughs' kindness t- towards animals. Mm-hmm. Uh, we mentioned Von Horst. One of my favorites is Von Horst in Old White, back to the Stone Age. There's, of course, um, um, Tarzan with uh, Nakima, Tarzan mm-hmm. with the Jad Balja, Tarzan with the Sheet of the Leopard here. Uh, I mean, you know who's in charge, but you also know Tarzan's got your back. Tarzan will look out for you. You yeah. love to work together. Uh, then there's other, oh, with knobs and land of the time for God is another good example of that. There's others. But uh, your point is well taken. I think a very good point is that uh, kindness uh, goes a lot farther than threats and, uh, and fussing. Mm-hmm. Right now, if I can Trust proceed, me. go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to, yeah, just back up what you were saying. You can't trust Rokoff, Rokoff to treat you right if you're working for him. Tarzan, you know, he'll watch out for you. If you're captured by bad guys, he'll do everything he has to do to rescue you. You know he'll be there for you, no matter what. Uh, Scott, you have something? No, no, I think you guys are hitting um, points of this very well. Well, thank you. Um, Hang on. (coughs) Pardon me, Tolf. Chapter 15, down the Ugambi River. So Tarzan's high on the trail of Rockoff. Uh, Tarzan's tracking reveals that Jane and Rockoff hid while the beasts of Tarzan pack passed them. Well, that's just great, uh, but <laughs> he's on their trail. Uh, he comes to the river and he sees a man drifting in a canoe. Well, uh, we know who that might be. Uh, Tarzan hits directly for that man, followed by Mugambi, the apes, and Sheeta, who are skirting the water. Uh, Tarzan discovers a man as Rockoff but Jane is no longer with him. So something happened there because last time we, we saw Jane, she was in the canoe and Rockoff was pulling his way in there. Uh, but now Rockoff has a canoe and there's no Jane to be found. So something, but there's this a, a event there that we've missed. Burroughs has not told us yet at all I mean, but we'll find out here directly. So Tarzan's in the water. He's about to close with Rockoff when, and this is an excerpt from chapter 15, <coughs> Excuse me. Excerpt begins. Then a sudden commotion in the water behind Tarzan caught his attention. He saw a ripple and he knew exactly what caused it. At the same instant, Tarzan felt mighty jaws close upon his right leg. He tried to struggle free and raise himself over the side of the boat. His efforts would have succeeded had not this unexpected interruption galvanized the blind brain of the Russian into instant action with a sudden promise of deliverance and revenge. <coughs> like a venomous snake, the man leaped toward the stern of the boat and with a single swift blow, struck Tarzan across the head with a heavy paddle. The ape man's fingers slipped from their hold upon the gunwale. There was a short struggle of surface and then a swirl of waters, a little eddy, and a burst of bubbles soon smoothed out by the flowing current marked for the instant the spot where Tarzan the apes Lord of the Jungle disappeared from the sight of men beneath the gloomy waters of the dark and forbidding Ugambi. <coughs> End of that uh, excerpt. This was just not a good time for a crocodile attack. That's what grabbed hold of Tarzan there and, and distracted him. So Rockoff begins to feel some relief with a coot and the others raise fine screams from the shore. Then Rockoff sees the Kincaid as the ship reached. Forgive me. 
<clears throat> Rockoff sees the Kincaid anchored in the bay. He paddles to it on trying to board. He is faced with the barrel of Jane's gun. She had narrowly escaped back at the canoe. Uh, in chapter 14, uh, boarded the ship, the Kincaid, and locked the drunken sleeping sailors in the forecastle. Rockoff is forced to land his canoe downstream on the opposite side of the pursuing pack and at dusk a boat approaches. That concludes chapter 15 and probably concludes my throat. Any thoughts mm -hmm. or questions? Well, Jane continues to be awesome. Um, I mean, she got away from Rokoff with her own canoe and intelligently handles boarding the ship, finding the two drunken sailors aboard, locking them up, and now she's like standing siege against anybody who tries to board. Um, she once again proves herself to be exceptional and brave and intelligent. And once again, she still has every reason to be in despair. She still thinks Tarzan's dead. She still has no idea what's happened to her baby son, Jack. She still doesn't see any way she can get out of this alive, but she is still acting with, uh, with courage and with intelligence. Um, uh, she just, uh, um, this, this, this book, I think rivals um, Tarzan the Untamed and Tarzan's Quest and just how awesome uh, Jane can be. Good point, good point. So, um, Scott, unless you have chapter 16. Yeah. Pick up on chapter 16 here? Yeah. Okay. Um, which actually will take us back to Tarzan. Actually, having Tarzan grabbed by the crocodile halfway through the chapter, I think was a very effective mid chapter cliffhanger. Um, Cause now we have to, we, we have no reason to see how Tarzan could get out and out of this alive. We have to wait an entire half chapter before we find out. Yeah. So, so uh, Scott, I'm sorry to interrupt, go ahead. No, you didn't interrupt at all. Uh, first couple of impressions at this point, and then I'll do the um, uh, general summary of, of what's coming up in these chapters. Um, the first point is that with this book, and as I said, it's been like 20 years since I read it last time. Um, I've been a big proponent of, of uh, Son of Tarzan. We're combining Tarzan, Return of Tarzan, the end of that together if, if there are going to be movies and along with, you know, we love the uh, Pellucidor and all those type of adventures. But rereading this and talking about it and, and, and then reviewing over each of these three weeks uh, segments that we've been doing on it. I've kind of come to the belief that everything that makes up the Beast of Tarzan would in a way maybe probably be the best of all Tarzan books to be made into a movie. It has everything you're looking at. It has the cosmopolitan, you know, Paris and London city uh, atmosphere environment in the beginning. You got the jungles. You got uh, the ocean and the islands, you know, kidnappings and escapes, uh, killings. Everyone likes killings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I, and twists and turns and the pace mm -hmm. on it. Um, it's just, it's, it's right there. You, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to deviate and say, well, let's make this statement about Tarzan or change these characters or whatever. This is for a, a, a 90 to 120 minute movie. To me, this is right on target. I, I my admiration of this um, book and and the possibilities of, of it being a film have, have grown a lot in the last few weeks. I would agree with all of that. So, um, chapter sixteen is called "In the Darkness of the Night" and <laughs> kicks right off with the crocodile. Um, uh, uh, it, Crocodile's uh, pulling him down, and even though he got hit in the head by a paddle from a Rokoff, in that struggle, Tarzan's able to get his head above water, and I get a good uh, uh, get some air into his lungs because he knows us in a battle. One of the things about this uh, segment coming up here with the crocodile is it isn't what we've seen in in a lot of movies and other things where he rolls over, grabs his neck puts his knife into it or slices the neck or something on, on and he wins, wins the battle. Uh, the description that Burroughs puts in here, you know, Tarzan's gonna, he's got other books to be in, so he's not gonna die. <laughs> yeah. 
but but he he describes it in a in a very tense and for what I think a lot of people would expect in in a pulp in a Tarzan story gives a lot of thought to the realism of what he's going through mm -hmm. so it, that draws you in um the detail on that's very good and and uh that crocodile pulls him underwater uh take him to his den and meantime tarzan's like he's not in a panic mode but he's doing whatever he can in 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 the cold dark water with not being able to breathe to try and do something to stop or hurt or or kill the crocodile um they do come up out of water and they're in uh well here's another thing this is a creepy thing for me <clears throat> when i start thinking about it, i'm going to read three or four short paragraphs here that do it but remember it's night nighttime he's taken underwater he's in a den uh um only way in and out is a, a water path uh, underground and he's underground like in a cave there's no light <laughs> you know, think about that and and, and uh, um, uh, as Tarzan's laying on the bank he's not being chomped or chewed on or anything at that point he reaches over and realizes somewhere he hit the crocodile and, and created a fatal wound because um, the uh, crocodile is dead now. So let me read this part here. Struggling to his feet, the ape man groped about the reeking oozy den. He found that he was imprisoned in a subterranean chamber amply large enough to have accommodated a dozen or more of the huge animal, such as the one that had dragged him thither. Think, think about that. You can't see anything. You're not sure what you're hearing. There could be a couple another big crocodiles half a foot from you, and you wouldn't know it. It gives me the heebie-jeebies. I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, uh, let me go in here. Uh, he realized that he was in the creature's hidden nest far under the bank of the stream, and that doubtless the only means of ingress or egress lay through the submerged opening through which the crocodile brought him. His first thought, of course, was of escape, but that he could also make his way to the surface of the river beyond and then to the shore seemed highly improbable. There might be turns and windings in the neck of the passage, or most to be feared, he might meet another of the slimy inhabitants of the retreat upon his journey outward. I think a lot of people start freaking out and panic. <laughs> Maybe give up, give up the ghost there. He's he's in the darkness here. He survived that attack from a crocodile. Is there another crocodile nearby that could do it? In fact, is there any other jungle creature, you know, uh, uh, pythons or snakes, uh, whatever that could uh, cause him to go out and then trying to blindly swim through a tunnel with. Uh, weeds and roots from trees probably and other things making your way through there it's uh it's a challenge it doesn't become a final obstacle for him but but it's a challenge and uh so he finally got to make the decision he he can't stay in a cave because he's he's gonna if nothing attacked him he's gonna just lay there and end up starving <laughs> he's gonna you know so he's gonna make the effort he does does manage to get himself out and up into the water and two other crocodiles are there and he um, is able to grab hold of a branch on a tree over the water and pull himself up and over um, out of reach of the jaws of the crocodiles there. Uh, these paragraphs, these uh, one to two pages of this, uh, to me is a very tense, um, uh, uh, involving thing like, like a mini like a mini horror story exactly um, yeah um, i agree i would not want to be in that situation like <laughs> <laughs> i guess a stupid thing to say nobody would want to be in that situation <laughs> but that's just the when whole you think point you're having just when you think you're having a bad day then a crocodile <laughs> <attack>. <laughs> <laughs> but you know here, here's the point um for most people who who have been writing for a while they've probably heard this somewhere along the line 
And for any of your aspiring writers out there, you may have already heard this, or you're going to con come across it sooner or later. Or if you're listening, you're going to come across it now. <laughs> uh, there's a general thing in uh, uh, that you see, and, and they point this out very specifically. You'll find this in movies, in the screenplays. But this goes for, for the novels, too. Always keep the protagonist, the hero, on a course of increasing danger. Mm -hmm. You know, you're kind of like, oh, that's done. Oh, now he, he should get rewarded, find Jane, and the story's done. Because you're like, <laughs> especially when you watch on a screen, you don't, you, know, you, don't, you don't want more danger, more things to happen to him. But you have to increase it because that's what pulls the reader or the viewer or the listener on uh, the, like the uh, old uh, um, asylum or, or uh, radio dramas and stuff you used to have. You have to increase that danger. And as the danger increases and your odds of losing increase, that brings the reader or the viewer into it. And that's... Burroughs was an expert at that. And you will find that in the modern day uh, writings. Um, if you go in uh, many times, whether it's, uh, you can say Stephen King for horror, or um, you got Clive Cussler um, for the adventure and, and a lot of other uh, authors, I'm just not gonna rattle them off, who are bestsellers, they're bestsellers because they're creating an environment and a storyline that keeps you hooked up. It doesn't get boring. There's something new every page or at least every chapter. But you're rooting for the hero to win. And then it's like, oh, crap. What's he going to do in this room with snakes, you know? Ugh, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> All those dangers. And, and, and this is where it keeps on coming. So he comes out. He mm -hmm. does do this. But at this time, he doesn't go into great detail about it. Tarzan does get away because you got to have that little breather after that last crocodile incident of what is ahead on that journey and at this point then he does um uh it is recognized that his leg is hurt he's he's not invulnerable he's not superman he does get hurt cut scarred knocked out uh and that brings it up there so you know um you you'll see him working that way and he starts thinking back about what he's heard so far and um earlier what tambunza and and um, told him and what he's what he himself has experienced or seen how people are acting, and he has brought himself to the point where he's convinced Jane is in London. Um, he doesn't know who else this other female might be, but that Jane is in London. She doesn't know anything that's going on. Um, she isn't aware of what happened to their baby, and that it's dead. Though Tarzan doesn't realize that it isn't Jack, that it isn't his son at this point. And so that's the mindset he's going on. And, and now um, the, the, uh, the uh, you want to call it the pain, the rage is boiling up into him because even if she's safe and that wasn't, <clears throat> or, uh, but the son is still dead. Now Rokoff, he's really getting ticked off because Rokoff at the point of, knowing none of this ha was happening, at least as, as Tarzan envisions it, lied to him to try and give him that additional emotional pain. So he be out for some blood at this time. <laughs> time to take Rokoff out. Um, so he, he uh, um, manages to get back uh, to the bay, the mouth of the river, and uh, the ocean area there. And um, he hears so sounds, he hears uh, voices uh, paddling um, uh, of uh, small vessels, canoes on the water there. And uh, then he hears some uh, shots and uh, scuffling and, and screams. And he we, keeps on going in that. Uh, I think I'm sorry, should, go ahead. Yeah, we should mention it was a moonless night when he got back there. So he's hearing all this, but can't see what's going on. Yeah, it's just like he's attacked and still nighttime. Yes, exactly. And um, uh, he continues on to the sound there. And then um, uh, what we're knowing, but he hasn't quite known yet, Burroughs is letting us know that Rokoff is there now. 
Uh, Jane's there. She has uh, um, uh, shot a couple of people there. Um, and uh, between the dugouts and, and where each person is at that time. Uh, and then um, um, they, they uh, I'm going to get, I almost got ahead of myself because I jumped into it too soon. Um, the, the, uh, anyway, he, he hears these noises. I almost, what reason I hummed him in my head, I was thinking, okay, this is, well, I'll tell you what scene I was thinking of in just about two minutes. Here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, people are now in their places. There's a ship and the dugouts and the boats and, and, uh, <laughs> Tarzan knows stuff is going on, but he's not sure <clears throat> who or where or why. He keeps on moving towards the uh, the noises so that he can uh, be closer and, and involve himself in what's going on. Uh, then that pretty much is where we're at the end of chapter 16. Uh, comments on? Yeah, um, there, there were a few other incidences. We do switch back to Jane's point of view. Um, because Rokoff has gotten back to the river mouth himself and hooked up back with some of the sailors who were ashore. Um, and Jane actually pegs a couple of them when they try to um, board on their dugouts, which is another awesome Jane moment. Um, yeah. She, she lets the two imprisoned sailors out to help cut the anchor and hopefully drift away, but uh, they manage to jump her and get a uh, wrestler to the deck and there's somebody climbing over the side of the ship as the chapter ends. And with another effective cliffhanger. Um, and I think what um, we've talked about in previous episodes, what's called interlacing, where Burroughs is moving back and forth along the timeline, telling us the events from different people's points of view, uh, doing so very effectively. Because once again, we always know where we are in the story and what's going on. But um, using, that, uh, using that technique of going, uh, of you know, moving forward for with uh, um, Tarzan trying to board the canoe and getting chomped by the crocodile and then jumping back to find out how Jean got away. Then jumping, you know, then Tarzan reaches the ship and here's what's going on. Then we jump back to get all that from Jane's point of view. Um, so the, he's continues to use that interlacing technique very, very effectively. Yes. And Jess, any other remarks? Uh, no, nothing for me. Okay. So uh, 17, uh, is titled On the Deck of the Kincaid. And here is another thing where he kind of pulls back in time a little to complete the journey into the present and what will be the future. He talks about uh, uh, the canoe with Mogambi um, uh, and, and the uh, uh, crew, ape crew that's helping him there uh, coming out and on the water and uh, Mogambi sees there's a a uh, woman also sleeping in the canoe doesn't know who it is, but as they're going down and through the stream, uh, and again, this is nighttime and dark, they uh, almost hit another uh, canoe. Well, that has Rokoff in it, and um, Rokoff knows who everyone here is by now, and shooting starts erupting, and, and the woman screams, and all of that type of thing uh, uh, is going on, what we were hearing back earlier there before. And um, uh, Tarzan ends up um, on the boat, being on, on the Kincaid, uh, takes the men who were throwing, trying to hold Jane down, gets them off of her, and uh, um, and of course, they're glad to see each other. But then Rokoff now is coming up behind them and onto the ship. And there's some more of the shooting and the fighting. And, and I, I, I'm not going to give all those details, but it's a general thing of it. The fighting keeps on going like that. And then uh, as it shows that with Mugami and, and his warriors, or some of his warriors are coming on board, Rokoff takes off to head to a uh, far part of the ship in order, he's trying to save himself. He realizes that the uh, odds are against him. 
And Tarzan's going to break his kind of, I guess, what people might call the Superman or Batman law. Um, and, and, and for here, the civilized or civilization law of uh, murdering someone because his rage is so deep. He's going to go ahead and kill Rokov anyway. But Jane now is next to him because with the uh, gorillas and everything's going on, she wants to stay next to uh, Tarzan for her own protection there. And um, she's like pulling him, pulling him back so he can't get to Rokov. And this is now, this is where I was thinking a couple of minutes ago, I was at it. I kind of lost that gap in my head here. Sheeta is with Tarzan and Sheeta comes running through and up and gets Rokov. And uh, describes, you know, Sheeta tearing Rokov apart and, and uh, he being, being killed that way by torn apart by a living beast. Some people might say that's awfully rough and all that, but we're talking again about a very, very evil part. Um, in that he, it feels like I would call this meaning. like uh, deserving. This this is nature yeah. working its way that this is a d death he deserved because this guy has done bad, bad things. Mm -hmm. you go ahead. What you're saying? I was going to say uh, it almost feels like he got off too too um, easy and dying relatively quickly, but it probably wasn't pleasant to be uh, torn up. You know. Or even though if even if he lost consciousness or died within a few seconds, it must have been a very unpleasant few seconds. And yeah, and if it, oh, go ahead. There is kind of an irony in the uh, the villain who represents the depraved part of civilization getting killed by a wild animal. Yeah, yeah, and and if Tarzan had killed him, it probably would have been even quicker. Yeah, you're you're with Ashita doing it. You're you know the. Animals going to be clawing them and, and ripping them open with the teeth because they go for that chest area, you know, rip out the arteries and stuff like that. But you do kind of wish, you know, she did, or he's almost dead and she just kind of step back and look at him, <laughs> let him lay there and then jump on him again like they do with cats do with mice. But uh, now I'm being bloodthirsty. <laughs> it's hard not to be bloodthirsty when you think about Rokoff. The man, the, yeah. the, he's like one of the most despicable villains in the history of literature. He, tr he truly, he truly is. Um, uh, I'd like to jump in here if I might. Uh -huh. um, and maybe you've already, you've already pointed this out, but the, the way circumstances turned out was she is doing the, uh, doing the execution, so to speak. Then that preserved Tarzan's, oh, reputation or record of, um, of, of not so far as this death would have been concerned. Granted, uh, uh, Rockoff and, and Paulvich both have been a thorn in the side, as you said, but, uh, and Tarzan certainly has dispensed jungle justice before and would do so again. But in this case, he was spared that before she got to him first. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's all. And, and, and if you go back and want to think about when uh, Rokoff was having him taunted and, and cut up um, and then to be eaten by the cannibals, that, that was much worse than mm -hmm. what Sheeta did in, you know, in uh, 90 seconds or two minutes to, to Rokoff. Uh, mm -hmm. Rokoff was trying to give, uh, give Tarzan basically the most torturous, worth, worse death you could give him. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. So the tables turned there. <laughs> So after all this is done in fighting, they uh, find um, most of Rokov's crew that's there, except uh, Povich is not. Povich has managed to uh, get away and get out of there, and uh, uh, they don't know where where he is. But they uh, um, uh, assume he's he's escaped, mm -hmm. and then uh, Jane does. Give the news that uh, uh, as they're talking to Tarzan that the uh, baby that died was not their son, so that he would know that and um, relays some of the adventures and talking about what the Swede had told her and what happened with him and all that. And that brings us to the end of chapter 17. Yeah, we should add that they did capture a few of the sailors alive, and they're having a spat of bad weather, but they plan to set sail as long as soon as the weather clears. 
So they yeah. have, they think they have an uh, escape route of home um, that'll get them home soon. Um, I, yes, I know that this is uh, one case where it was serialized in uh, the pulp magazines first. This is one case where Burroughs had to expand it to make it a little longer before it could be published as a novel. And I have never seen the original pulp version. So this is just a guess. But I'm going to guess that perhaps the story ended here in the pulps with them sailing home in the Kincaid and that what follows with the time bomb and with a new set of bad guys that show up for a chapter or two is what Burroughs added to make it book length. Um, and once again, I have not seen the pulp story and this is just a guess, but I would not be surprised if that turned out to be true because with Rokoff dying, this would have been a logical place to end this particular story. Yeah, yeah, it would have been. But Burroughs has a few more things up his sleeve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so chapter 18 is called uh, Povich Plots Revenge. Now, Povich is on shore, and uh, but he wants to get back to the boat, as you're talking about. His plan is to destroy it, plant a bomb, get his revenge, or um, or just take everybody out of the picture and, and get away with that. He goes to a village, it's a Masula village, and uh, uh, people there that, and the chief, they won't, they're not going to help him. They're not going to give him a boat to take down the stream and, and uh, go on over and get aboard the ship there. So he uh, waits and bides his time kind of on the stream until a, uh, a youth comes by in a, in a dugout and um, he, he jumps in, grabs, kills, kills him in order to take the canoe down the river and keep going down. So he does that. And this is showing that this guy, you know, well, he worked so long with Rokoff, but he's got the same um, non conscionable I guess, approach to uh, uh, death, really kill, kill a youth like this doesn't mean anything to him. That he's not worried about it, you know. So um, he's he, he's just uh, as cruel as we were talking about Rokoff in my book. Um, he does paddle out and crosses the river and gets into uh, next to their boat and is able to climb up ladder onto the Kincaid and uh, finds one of the people who were with him and, and with Rokoff to. Um, get him to help him to go along with this. Uh, but the guy won't, but he sees the opportunity here to get something out of it. And in turn tells Polvich that um, you're here, I'm gonna turn you in unless you got something good you could give me like lots of money. So uh, at that point, Polvich says, okay, he, he will, he will. And they go down to the cabin where Polvich has his stuff and had been staying on the ship earlier there. And um, while he's there, he's got a time bomb hidden like under a drawer desk area there. And he sets that off to, um, he wants to blow up the ship and kill everyone on there. And he pays the uh, other guy off. Um, he, he'd rather keep the money, but he's not gonna take the time to try and kill him or, or give himself away on a ship. So he, he gives him the money so he does get off the ship and tries to get away before there's an explosion getting back to shore and that wraps up that's a, it's a little shorter uh chapter but uh there's actually some very important uh action and information uh events that go on in, yeah, in yeah. That, those few pages and Paulvich does seem to escape justice but we find out in son of tarzan that um, he spends a very uncomfortable and unhappy 10 or 12 years stranded in Africa for a while. Uh, yeah. Meets a, a, meets a rather violent end eventually anyways. Um, so we have to wait till the next novel for Polvich to get his, but <laughs> we can take comfort in knowing that his life will be absolutely miserable between then and now. And that reminds me that uh, also in Son of Tarzan, another preview for that kind of story is that Akut uh, makes an appearance there. Mm -hmm. and we've come to know who we've come to know and, and admire in this book. Yeah, in fact, he's a very key character in Son of Tarzan. Indeed. Um, 
Okay, uh, well, I will cover the last three chapters. Chapter 19 is called The Last of the Kincaid. Um, Tarzan's telling the renegade crewmen that he won't prosecute them um, uh, as part of the being Rokoff's plot, you know, part of Rokoff's plot, uh, you know, and they agree to sail the ship uh, back home. Um, they're very nervous about the apes and the cheetah on board, but, uh, but you know, to avoid going to jail for the rest of their lives or maybe going to the hangman's noose, they will sail the ship. Uh, so the weather finally clears and they go out into the Atlantic. Um, Tarzan is just eager to get home as quickly as possible because London's the logical part to pick up the search for his kidnapped son. Um, it's, neither he nor Jane have any idea where he is yet. But then the time bomb that Paulvich planted goes off. Um, they have to abandon the, the, um, the Kincaid as it sinks on lifeboats. And uh, Tarzan you know, keeps his head as he always does, takes a leadership position as he always does, organizes an evacuation, and they end up back on the jungle island that, uh, that the beasts of Tarzan all came from, that Tarzan was stranded on at the beginning of the book. So the, the apes and cheetah are just happy to be home. Um, they never liked all that canoeing, canoe rowing and sailing on water. And they're where they should be. They run off into the jungle and they're happy. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the humans though are ashore and they watch the Kincaid, Kincaid, Kincaid burn for a couple of hours. Then there's a second explosion and what's left of the ship is, uh, uh, goes under. Um, so they are stranded on the same island that Tarzan was stranded on. Uh, a number of chapters before. Um, and the only comment I'll make is, make is that once again, we see that Burroughs never forgets that the apes are not humans, that they are apes and they act like apes. As they, they don't stay to try and help Tarzan organize a camp. As soon as they see their home jungle, they say, cool, and they run off into the jungle. Um, and Tarzan is not surprised by that at all because that's what apes would do. Um, Cheetah goes off into the jungle as well. So that kind of like you know, breaks up the band, so to speak. It's like the Beatles um, um, breaking up. Um, <laughs> so, so any comments from you guys about chapter nineteen? I, I never, I never had that comparison in my head, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, now Beatles I'm picturing animals after all. <laughs> yeah. Now, now I'm picturing a Saturday morning cartoon version of this by Hanna Barbera, where Tarzan and the Apes form a band, and we get a song at the end with them playing. So. Well, now I am. I'm imagining several things, but I, I immediately, yeah, I, I have the, I have what you just said. You just took it. Yeah, that's exactly what I imagine. Please continue. I'm, I'm speechless. I'm, for once okay. in my life, I'm speechless. Tarzan and the Beast, their hit signal, single, coming up right after this word from our sponsor. Okay. Um, <laughs> chapter 20 is Jungle Island again. So um, the castaways are setting up camp. A couple of weeks go by. Um, Tarzan's keeping them organized and working on a, on a ship that they might be able to sail um, away on. But remember, these are bad guys. Uh, that they had found in the canoe that's now, uh, um, you know, she and McGumby are kind of falling for each other. Everybody else here is a bad guy. All the sailors were riffraff that were cooperating with, um, with Tarzan simply to avoid prosecution. So there is low morale, there's dissension, there's suspicion in the camp. Um, and then there's a new set of bad guys come up. Uh, a set of villains on a ship called the Cowrie land uh, on, the, on another part of the island. Um, and there are several bad guys in charge here. They have mutinied and taken over this ship. There is a guy named Gust. There is Mo Gust, G-U-S-T. There is Momula, the Morai. Uh, a Morai. I, now that I'm reading it aloud, I realize I should know how to pronounce it, but don't, don't know. So I apologize for probably getting that mispronounced. And a, uh, a Chinese criminal named Kei Shang. Um, and they are also having dissension and low morale, arguing amongst themselves, planning on double crossing each other. Um, they meet a couple of um, the sailors from the camp and ally themselves to double cross uh, Tarzan. 
but they also try to kill Gust, one of their co-leaders, because they're just double-crossing each other. They have this is a group that has chronic backstabbing syndrome. Um, so the chapter ends with Gust escaping from uh, from the others just as just as just before they can carry out their plans to kill him. So we've been introduced to another set of bad guys who um, who are who uh, are are on a a ship that they uh, took over after killing the legitimate uh, officers of that ship. Uh, they have teamed up with some of the bad guys from Tarzan's camp, but they have one member of the group who's had the run from them. Um, so there's a lot going on in what is relatively a short chapter. And it really sets up what's kind of a short story within the main novel, um, which is why I'm kind of thinking that this is probably what Burroughs added later on after the original pulp story was published to make the book novel length for when it was published as a hardcover. Uh, any comments from you on this chapter? Tarzan and the Beast doing their next big hit, Chronic Backstabbing. <laughs> <laughs> chronic Backstabbing, Steve. <laughs> the number one hit, Chronic Backstabbing Syndrome by Tarzan and the Beast. Exactly, um, that's what I was trying to say. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, can't you just picture a silly Hanna-Barbera cartoon with, or filmation with, uh, you know, a, a crudely Amazon, uh, uh, animated Tarzan playing guitar? Um, well, it worked for the Archies. Did yeah. there we go. <laughs> and they had a hit. Well, I, I, I was figuring somehow in the worlds of uh, of uh, you know the multiverses or whatever, and uh, uh, when Tarzan. Is tied to a stake and camels are getting ready. You can't have John, Paul, George, and Ringo coming through. Help, my name's somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious. You know, Tarzan and Jane took the, you know, we're both uh, had, were given functional immorality. They didn't eat, uh, immortality and morality. Functional immorality, that's terrible. We're given functional immortality <laughs> later on. So they're around yeah. when the Beatles are big. So a Tarzan Beatles team up is this. Uh, I have no idea what the adventure would be, but it's kind of interesting to think about. So they, you know, they could replay uh, chapters uh, uh, 16, 17, 18 and have the soundtrack <laughs> to Hard Day's Night. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this all underlines the thing we've been saying is that this is really an excellent book. And it's it a magnificent is. adventure, as you can sure as tell, we're having a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of interesting how many Beatles songs seem to fit as appropriate background music for this story. Uh, I, <laughs> so. I think you're on to something. Yeah. Okay, so chapter 21, um, The Law of the Jungle is going to bring the story to a confusion, to, con to a conclusion. First I said functional immorality, then I said to a confusion. Um, yeah, there we go. So uh, Kai Shang, the leader of the villains, um, and his his hench people, they kidnap Jane and they kidnap the uh, Masula woman who, who had joined the party. Um, Tarzan looks for them. He meets Gust, who, remember, had to run from the other bad guys. Um, and Gust puts the eight men on Kai Chang's trail. Um, but they're now on the captain of their ship and they're going out to sea. Um, Tarzan has like, a horrible moment where it looks like they're going to get away with Jane and he can't do a thing about it. But the Cowrie does not have an engine. It is a sailing ship. And the wind dies down and um, the, it's, it's becalmed for a few minutes. So he quickly, Tarzan quickly summons Sheeta and Akut and the other apes. Um, he gets them back in a, in a, a couple of canoes one more time. Um, they board the ship. Um, the, Tarzan just lets them loose on the bad guys. Um, they kill Kai Shang and all the, you know, and all the other renegades, except two who were captured. Um, Jane and the Masilla woman are saved. Um, he, Tarzan takes the beast back to their island. Um, and they sail away on the Cowrie. And a couple of days later, they meet a British warship and they get a radio message that the baby has been safe back in London all this time. Um, after it was kidnapped by Rokoff's henchmen, they, uh, the, the, one of those henchmen, you know, double-crossed them, switched babies, and made a deal to get some ransom money with, uh, with Tarzan's estate back home. 
So the baby's been safe all these months. Uh, so they can go on home with them. They're bringing Mugambi with them and the Masola woman who Mugambi is, uh, is gonna marry. Uh, and Tarzan proposes they all live together on his African estates in the land of the Wazari. And Mugambi is a major character in the Jewels of, uh, Jewels of Ophar. So we know he takes Tarzan up on this and becomes a loyal friend. Um, so that um, is the end of the novel um, with everybody safe, with the beast of Tarzan coming back for one more appearance before the novel ends, which once again is an indication of Tarzan earning the loyalty of the people he leads or the animals he leads, that they will follow him. Because um, there's no way the apes wanted to go back onto the water again. They hated it the whole time. But Tarzan asked them to, and he's a good leader and a, uh, a leader who looks out for his people. And they followed him and they helped save Jane this one last time. Um, and as I said, I think this last couple of chapters almost feels like a separate short story from the main story. But I don't say that as a criticism. Um, it, flow, it, you know, it flows into this new little mini adventure very naturally. And it uh, introduces new characters very quickly, but very effectively. And um, it's just a fun little mini adventure to bring the Beast of Tarzan to a close. Um, any comments from you guys? No, I think, I think you summed it up very nicely. Good okay. wrap up, I think, yeah. One thing I would like to say is that I have created what I call a chapter cliffhanger analysis. Uh, for the first five books of the Tarzan series, with the Beast of Tarzan being the third one. Because um, I was curious about this, about how many cliffhangers end with a character in direct danger, how many end with the revelation of, uh, with an important event happening or the revelation of important information, and how many times a chapter ends fairly prosaically without something overtly dramatic happening. And I created a chart with each chapter given a two, a value of two, if it ends with someone in direct danger, a value of one, which if it ends with a dramatic event or a dramatic revelation of information, and a zero, if it ends more prosaically. And these, these are numbers, these are not numbers that judge the quality of these chapters. It's just a way of rating them. Um, I added these numbers up and then divided them by the number of chapters. And that creates the a uh, cliffhanger index. That's a brand new thing in literature, as far as I know, a cliffhanger, cliffhanger index. Uh, the higher the number, the more often a chapter ends in a cliffhanger with the characters in serious danger. And of the first five Tarzan novels, the uh, cliffhanger index for Beast of Tarzan is 1.33. It is the highest of the five. So you have more intense cliffhangers in this book than you do in the other five chapters other five Tarzan books. And I don't think you, uh, this, the, the, you know, Tarzan of the Apes has the lowest one, 0 0.93, but I don't think Tarzan of the Apes is any less exciting than Beast of Tarzan. It just has a slightly different purpose. It's involved, it, it follows Tarzan as he's growing up and learning to be Tarzan. So chapters often end with him winning a fight or some other accomplishment that is slowly growing him into the man he'll be. Um, whereas Beasts of Tarzan is a straight adventure tale from start to finish. So there you have it. Uh, the, um, the Tarzan chapter uh, cliffhanger analysis, um, which, um, you know, I think I've invented a new literature, uh, literary analysis technique with this, unless someone's beaten me to it in some form in the past. So, it is a technique, though, that can be applied to any other Burl story, heck, any other story, period. You want oh, yeah. To, want I, to compare books. Yeah, uh, I'm actually going there to... Are, there are mathematical techniques to get for those books that have different different though uh, page numbers and that sort of thing. There are mathematical uh, uh, page counts, I mean. Mm -hmm. Like one book may have 200 pages, another book may have 500 pages. Uh, there are mathematical tools to get those things on an even setting, on a common denominator, so to speak. So you can still make some kind of work all comparison. So I think you've got a very handy technique here, which I, which I would not that I'm trying to volunteer for, for work to do, but I would, I would like to explore this a little bit further with some of the other Burroughs books at some point. Yeah, I would, I would like, I'm actually submitting what I've done so far to the ERB APA uh, publication. So it will be Good idea. The next one when we're recording this is issue 153. 
-hmm. So it should be in there. But I would actually like to eventually do the rest of the Tarzan series and compare it also to the Mars series and the Pellucidor series, which I think are the, the other two that have enough books to get a general sense of, of what the cliffhanger and oh. certainly, I, I, as a youngster, uh, I, I, mostly, for, I would say, probably for movies and TV shows, but certainly there in the books, too, that I began to love the cliffhanger. I mean, it just leaves you hanging until next week um, mm -hmm. or, or the next time that the show pops up. <laughs> Some movies might be a year or two later, but it's a very exciting technique to build interest and buzz. Yep. Um, yeah, so I will, I'll keep, I'll keep working on it and eventually have the entire Tarzan series analyzed with the, with cliffhanger indexes for all of them and also the Mars and Pellucidor books. I um, much appreciate it, but you're done. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, it, you know, also gives me handy entries for future issues of the, um, ERB APA. So, <laughs> so I'm, yes. I'm, I'm like covering several bases at once. Um, any other comments at all about Beasts of Tarzan from you two before we start wrapping it up? It'd just be uh, uh, redundant, I guess, to say <laughs> how, how much uh, um, how much this book has, has grown mm -hmm. uh, compared to my memories and, and the steam I hold it in now. Yeah. Um, it really is an excellent book. And I think I agree with you, Scott, that it could make a superb movie with that, and I realize movies are a different medium from books. You often have to change some things, but um, just as a layperson, I don't see a lot that you would have to change to make uh, Beast of Tarzan into a really fun action movie. Yeah. So, well, I'll um, complete the trifecta and, and, and agree with both of you. Mm -hmm. So um, that's it for Beast of Tarzan. We will be back soon. We're planning on our next book being uh, I Am a Barbarian, a book that uh, Jess, correct me on this. This was published after Burroughs died, right? It was not published during his lifetime? It, that is correct. 1967, if memory serves. Mm -hmm. okay. I can check that. Yeah, it's his Roman Empire book. Um, so it's it's a little bit different from his Tarzan books. I think it will be really fun to talk about and analyze. Um, until then, um, I may have time to do some more mini episodes where I've been looking at other authors who were contemporaneous to Burroughs. Um, and... Um, also visit our store. We do have a store where so you can buy Burroughs podcast swag um, at cafepress.com slash, um, e slash ERB podcast. Um, and that will be the link will be in the show notes. Um, you can get t-shirts, um, uh, cups with, uh, with great Burroughs images on it. Uh, the Egg and Rice Burroughs Incorporated people were very kind in giving us permission to use copyrighted images on this. Uh, we have a great artist, Ben Alvarez, creating um, um, uh, original illustrations based on Burroughs books. Um, and just there's great stuff. Somebody recently brought a, bought a t-shirt with a griff on it. Um, so somebody out there is wearing a griff t-shirt. So whoever that is, thank you. Uh, so we would, uh, so just take a look at what we have available in the store. Um, you know, just think how cool it is and when you're shopping and you whip out your wallet with a with Tars Tarkas printed on it to, to uh, pay for your groceries. You know, um, everybody around you will be impressed. So support, support your friendly Griff. So yes, yeah, support your friendly Griff. Yes, all proceeds go to the Griff Humanitarian Organization. Um, where we're trying to get the, the people of Palo and Don to stop, to stop beating them, to make them do what they want. So, um, and... Uh, please feel free to visit my blog at Comics Old Time Radio and other cool stuff where I write about uh, stories uh, from the pulp era and also old movies and comic books. Um, you can find links to my books there and feel free to buy my books and make me wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice. Uh, Jess, anything you want to plug before we sign off? Well, I've got to say that I was correct on my guesstimate. I Am a Barbarian was indeed published 1967 as I thought. It was written April, September, 1941. There just before World War II broke out for the USA, that is. Okay. Uh, but uh, did not see print on 1967. Uh, certainly I've enjoyed uh, uh, tonight and our two prior discussions on Beasts of Tarzan. I always enjoy uh, our, our book uh, discussions and analyses uh, that, that the three of us have. Always, always have a great time. 
This has been a pleasure as always. Um, Thank you. So uh, my name is Chess Terrell, and you will find me on Facebook at the For Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs. And uh, there we talk uh, Burroughs and Tarzan and the other Burroughs characters, worlds and and, and uh, situations. We discuss those 24-7. Hope you come join us. For Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs. Again, I'm Scott Stewart. Uh, I'd like to uh, throw in again, just to remind people, uh, in June, the uh, uh, ERB Dum Dum being held in San Antonio. Great time convention, great time to catch up and meet people you may have heard on a podcast or some show or read uh, their books. A lot of really good people show up there. And uh, it's always a fun time. And uh, also, I was going through, it's been a few weeks with uh, schedule back out looking, catching up on some of the uh, ERB comics on the uh, ERB comics page. And the quality of the writing and art is, is phenomenal. So, friends, <laughs> if you're not a member, or don't go out and read those. Go ahead and do that. My understanding is very soon, in the next couple months, the uh, part of the um, Tarzan strip is finally going to be collected and published. So you can have hard copies of, of that uh, series. Uh, really very well done and, and highly recommend it. Uh, other than that, again, just thanks for everyone who's listening here and thanks guys for always a fun time talking with you. And I won't be able to make, I won't be able to make the dum dum, but if you guys do uh, get there, be sure to wear one of our store t-shirts. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so, Do so um, I can give one away. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, um, and also everybody remember you can email us uh, at, er, at eggersmailbag uh, at gmail.com. Uh, that'll also be in the show notes. Um, but please let us know uh, your opinions on Beast of Tarzan or other books we've discussed in the series, or uh, let us know which books of Burroughs you might want to hear, let us uh, hear us talking about in the future. Um, we, we love to hear from our listeners. Um, you can also leave comments on any of the social media platforms we will post these episodes on. Um, and we just really enjoy hearing from people. It's always a treat uh, to actually have hard evidence that people actually listen to us. So um, that is it for now. Uh, thank you again all for listening and we will be back soon. <laughs>